We are uh, continuing our series in the Psalms, and this morning we're in Psalm 63. Let me, uh, let me pray for us. Uh, Lord in heaven, we, uh, we pray that these words from David would speak to us this morning, uh, written long ago. Uh, sometimes, sometimes it seems that something that is old and uh, so old might not have much bearing on us today, but Lord, we pray that we would hear your word afresh and that we would receive it as your word to us this morning. Speak to us, Lord. We long to hear from you. Uh, Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations and the thoughts, uh, the things that we desire and contemplate and mull over uh, be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Uh, This week was a week uh, for hospitals for me. In a normal month, I probably visit the hospital about once as a pastor. But this week I was at the hospital four times and I really could have been there more than that. Let me tell you some of what's going on. Many of you know that our uh, dear sister, Mary Watts, is in the hospital. She's in the hospital downtown at Harrisburg. She's in uh, observation room 14 down there. Um, Last Saturday, she was with her hiking group that she's been a part of for over 50 years up in Lewistown, hiking. Last Sunday, she made coffee for all of you. Monday, she's in the hospital. Her heart seemed off. She called her cardiologist and was sent to the hospital. The doctors are monitoring how the medications are taking to her body. And a week now in the hospital, um, yesterday, some of you know this, many of you probably don't, but Barb Kohler, our dear sister, Barb Kohler, who's regularly in worship with us, her husband, Don, passed away yesterday morning. Um... We spent some time together, Don and I, last week because he actually went to the hospital on August 4th. So we, t- we spent some time reading scripture and praying and talking together and talking about life, but this week he hasn't spoken at all. They didn't expect him to stay in the hospital. They didn't expect him to pass away, but he did. Friday, he and Barb and I and Barb's daughter, we prayed together and read scripture and sang together and... He passed away yesterday morning. Um, Cindy Russo texted me Wednesday night. A lot of us were painting Wednesday. Thank you for uh, painting. But I got home to receive a text from Cindy. Her brother, Brian, who's 59 years old, passed away. He has cancer, had cancer. He went in for his first day of treatment on Wednesday. And he passed away that night. He's over at the West Shore Hospital with family and friends gathering around him to mourn. Of course, there was laughter. Supposedly, he was a super funny guy. There was laughter, but it was mostly mourning, a lot of crying, a lot of pain. It was shocking, and he was 59 years old. Um, Ed Camp and I had breakfast together Thursday morning. I mentioned this last week, but Labor Day will be the passing of Anna, the, the anniversary, the first anniversary of when Anna died. And this coming week will have been, would have been their 65th anniversary. Um, we didn't talk about that as much. We actually talked quite a bit about just his boys and the sadness of losing his eldest, Eddie, when Eddie was 21 years old. Some of you remember this, driving on his way with some friends to the shore for a weekend. He was hit and killed on the spot. And Ed said, to this day, that is still the worst day of his life. And that reminded me of one of my close family friends. Many of you know that I was home a month ago and I was there in part because I was there for a couple weddings, including my younger brother's wedding, but I was also there with my family for a, a, a funeral of one of our dearest friends, sort of like my second mom growing up. She died at 72 years old after a dozen years of Alzheimer's. But that's actually, Eddie's death didn't remind me so much of that, but actually the, the accident that happened to their youngest child, Chelsea. She actually rode her bike to our house and she left to go to another friend's house. She wasn't even 10 years old. And going through a blind turn was hit by a car. Her bike 
ended up back behind the car and she was airlifted to Harborview Hospital in Seattle where she spent months after months. Of course, days and days and weeks were spent in that hospital room. Um, her dad, Bill, and my parents were there and friends were there and I was there with her occasionally. Um, she's actually doing remarkably well. She spoke at her mother's funeral. She spoke beautifully at her mother's funeral. You wouldn't be able to tell now. But it was the worst day of their family's life. So here's the question for this morning. It's the title of the sermon. What does the worst bring out in you? The worst stuff bring out in you. And I'm not totally sure what the, you think the worst is, um, but here is the reality is there are so many, so many heinous and awful events that take place in our lives and in our world. Horrendous things that should never have happened. What does it do? Some of you have experienced some of those things. Maybe it's been a child that's grown up and they want nothing to do with you. They're not returning any calls. They're not engaging with you at all. As far as they're concerned, you're dead to them. Uh, Maybe it's been divorce and unfaithfulness. Uh, Maybe it's been mental illness that just persists and worsens. And the medications that you take seem to have all of the effects that are mentioned at the end of those commercials that just drone on and on and on. You're like, there's no way that something has that many effects. And then you actually experience it. Maybe you had another miscarriage and another relationship fall apart. Uh, Maybe your singleness feels like the worst. Maybe your marriage feels like the worst. Um, Not getting picked for the basketball team at recess can actually feel like the worst at at times. It feels like you're out of the social club, of the fun. Um, Your best friend moving away to another state can actually feel like the worst. I have a good friend whose house burned down when he was in college. His guitar was burnt. All of his books and his photos burnt. All these memories gone. Maybe that's been the worst. So here's the question. What does the worst bring out in you? Um, The Bible says a good deal about how awful the world is about how prevalent suffering is. Um, There's no way that you can come to the Bible and just think, oh, it's some romantic text to make us just feel good about the world and our place in it. There's like no time. There's no space for that in Holy Scripture. Um, A lot of it has to do with the hardship of life and the sufferings of this world. Um, And the Bible gives us clues at times for what God might be up to in the midst of some of these things. But if you wrestle with it, the Bible doesn't give you a complete answer as to like why and what with all of this worst that's happening. I mean, we can read at the end of the book of Genesis, Joseph telling his brothers and rightly telling them, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. When you sold me into slavery, talk about the worst, being sold into slavery, you meant it for evil. But God meant it for good. And that's true. And that's really a beautiful passage that God works these awful things for our good. But here's the fact is that for the most part, we don't actually get to see the good that comes out of so much of the worst of life. Joseph got to see it. A lot of you haven't seen it. Um... The reality is that for most of us, when the worst happens, it brings us up all kinds of questions about God and his ability and his goodness and his power. And what's he doing? Why is this happening? And for a lot of us, we kind of think, maybe we should just give up on this God thing. At least that's the temptation. It's certainly been my temptation. I guess it's been the temptation for many of you. When the worst happens, do you run from God? Do you run to him? 
It seems like those are the two options that we're most often faced with. Uh, as Gordy Zubrod, preaching a few weeks ago, said, does it break you or remake you? Does it break you or remake you? What does the worst bring out in you? Um, I keep asking this because of actually the little title in the psalm. You know, a lot of times we get these little snippets, these little pictures of what was the event that caused the writing of this psalm. And this is all it says. If you have the text open before you can see this, it's just very simple. It says, the psalm of David, when he was in the wilderness of Judah. That doesn't sound like a lot. Like, David, you could help us out. Give us a little bit more than that, maybe. But here's the thing. When, this is the question you should be asking. When was he in the wilderness of Judah? What's he even talking about? And the answer is when he was betrayed and kicked out of Jerusalem and had to flee for his life from Absalom. Who's Absalom? It's his son. It's his third born son. Many people think it was his favorite son. Not that parents have favorites, kids. Some do, unfortunately. Absalom's name means peaceful, <laughs> or actually means father of peace. Father of peace. Ab Shalom. Like, um, But his life did not bring peace. Can you imagine naming your child something? You know, we name them with the desires that we have for them. What are they going to live into? How are they going to be in the world? What are they going to grow up to accomplish? This will be the father of peace. Fatherly desires for your child. And Absalom seemed to have everything going for him. Listen to this. This is how he's described in 2 Samuel uh, 14, verses 25 and 26. Now in all Israel, there was no one so much to be praised for his handsome appearance as Absalom. From the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. And get this, you who share my hair, when he cut the hair of his head, for at the end of every year he used to cut it, when it was heavy on him, he cut it. He weighed the hair of his head 200 shekels by the king's weight. Every year he grew five pounds of hair. He had everything going for him. He was the king's son and he was handsome. People loved him, but he was greedy. And he was cunning. And he did not bring peace. He plotted against his very father. And his father fled for his life away from his son. With all those desires of having somebody to grow up to be a father of peace. And he didn't just plot against his father. What you heard actually, as Rebecca read for us from the next chapter, chapter 15 was that he also got his father's own confidants, his father's own counselors to betray him and to plot against him. He conspired against his father in that kind of way. That chapter, chapter 15, verse 13 says this, and a messenger came to David saying, the hearts of the men of Israel have gone after Absalom. Then David said to all his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee, or else there will be no escape for us from Absalom, my son, who I thought might be a father of peace. The very people that David loved the most and trusted the most were the ones who went with his beloved son who he thought would bring peace. Now, here's, here's kind of my point with this. I can think of a lot of worsts, and you can. You can list your worsts, right? The events in your life that make you go, God, no, forget that. Powerful, good, able, forget it. I can think of a lot of worst situations. 
This is among them. A father with hopes and desires for children, that own child plotting the father's very demise, using his skill and his ability and his beauty and his place in society to bring down and to tear down rather than to build up and to bring peace. And so to that situation that David and some others who were faithful to him fled for their lives to the wilderness of Judah. That is the story of the writing of this Psalm. That's the context. So David is in a dry and weary place and you should hear that and not just think like it's his soul though it is, but he's in this wilderness. He's actually fleeing for his very life. He's in a place where clinging to God is a must. Verse nine tells us uh, that there are those who are seeking to destroy his life. They're liars. They're plotting against him. They're spreading lies against him. And I have to keep posing this question to you. What does the worst bring out for you? What do you do when the worst happens? Does it break you or remake you? Now there are three sections to this Psalm. You can see them pretty clearly. They're kind of broken up in our text here. Um, And I want to suggest to you just three things from the Psalm that the worst brought out in David. And I'll just say this. I didn't make up these three points. I thought this was good enough that I was like, I'm just going to steal that. I'm borrowing it from Derek Kidner from his commentary in Psalms, which is a fantastic commentary and worth your time reading. So David found that in the worst first, his desire was for God. Okay, first his desires for God in the midst of the worst. Let's read this, these first few verses again. Oh God, you're my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there's no water, so I've looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. I will bless you as long as I live in your name. I will lift up my hands. And I think this kind of feels amazing, especially if you situate this in this context of where he is and what's been going on and all this kind of stuff. What he doesn't say is, earnestly, I seek to be back in Jerusalem and just be on the throne. Earnestly, I'm seeking after not fleeing for my life because this is scary you know, all those kinds of things that he could obviously say, or earnestly I seek the downfall of this wicked son who was misnamed by me. Um, one of the things that suffering does in our lives is it focuses us. It shows us what's really important. Um, one of the things that the worst does for us is it causes us to say, what do I really desire What do I want? And David says, I want God. I mean, I've put my peace in these other things. My children, my throne, my physical ability as a warrior, my mental know-how my musical abilities on the lyre. And he says, no, all of that. What I desire is the peace, the shalom of God. I want God. I want to suggest to you that there's actually a little detail here that actually kind of speaks specifically to this. Of course, verse one, that's what he's saying. I want you. But also he says, so I've looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. If you think with me back to the, tabernacle that David would have been familiar with, or also the temple, which, you know, was, was after David inside of the tabernacle and inside of the temple, there were these beautiful curtains and there were these ornament, ornamental, uh, lampstands and all these kinds of things. And what they were to do was to uh, evoke in the person entering that you were hearkening back to Eden and forward to the heavenly places. There were images of trees and and flowers, but also of angelic beings. And you were supposed to think, this is where God resides. 
And what do I know of Eden? And what do I know of the new heavens and the new earth? But that's where peace is. What he's saying is, God, I desire you because it's only where you are where peace is found. He's remembering God in the sanctuary. He's saying, God, that's all I desire is you. We just say one of the options when the worst happens to you is actually to desire God more and more and more. To find that all the stuff that we're kind of looking for to give us shalom and rest and peace, it can be found nowhere else. And it, that's kind of reinforced for us in this second section, okay? So first, um, David found in the midst of this worst that his desire is for God. But then the second thing that we see, and I'm going to at least point out a little detail here that I think will help. Hopefully you'll see this is that his delight is God. He actually has delight in God, not just desires him, but delights him. And this, okay, this second section, verses five through eight, my soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. And my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, For you've been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. Now, he's mentioning sleeping and and whatnot, and I want you to just picture this. He has fled. You know, when you flee, you're not like, oh man, I get to get all these pillows and all these blankets. You know, you're just like, I gotta go. Here's a tent. We're going to the wilderness. Let's go. And he's laying in his bed, which is probably a very unpleasant situation, And he's thinking maybe back to his life in Jerusalem. And uh, he thinks of like the good things there. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. But he just says as with. He's not saying, you know what? I will be satisfied when I just get to sit down and eat a big steak and have some Cab Franc with it and just chill out. He's saying, no, because that is not going to be anything that actually satisfies. He says, the thing that actually gives me delight is not the things of this world. It is not the things of this world. It is you. The things of this world, the good things are just pictures of the delight of God. God will be his satisfaction. God will be his delight. Now, okay, I want you, I want to sit with this for a moment, okay? Okay. Because I think part of what is so horrendous about the worst in life is that they're pretty much always related to the best in life. Um, I mean, David finds himself in this worst kind of situation. And he does, he finds himself in this worst situation because it is his child that does it. Right? The worst things are in some ways related to the best things. You can think with me, of course, of the worst that's happened to you or the worst that you know of. Um, The abuse of a family member. Family members are supposed to be good. The unfaithfulness of a spouse. Spouses are gifts. The worst is related to the good. The worst is when the best is taken from us, from a betrayer. And David says here, I can think of some of the good things in life. And all those things are ever to do is to point me to you. Because what happens when I put my ultimate desire and my ultimate delight in the things of this earth is that they are fading. They don't give lasting satisfaction. If I'm placing it in there and they're taken from me, I'm utterly crushed. My faith, my desire, my delight can only be in the Lord. One of the things that the worst can show us is this, or or pose to us is this question. Where, Where are you finding your delight? What do you love in the world? Uh, It's kind of like what C.S. Lewis says in his book, The Problem of Pain, which is this. He says that pain is God's magnophone 
to rouse our deaf world. Sometimes what suffering does, what pain does, what the worst does, is it causes us to say, whoa, that was my desire? That was my delight? Maybe it needs to be in the Lord. Okay, David found in the midst of the worst that not only was God his desire and his delight, but finally that uh, God was his defense, meaning that God is his only security, okay? Let me read the last bit, okay. But those who seek my, to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be apportioned for jackals, but the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exult. The mouths of liars will be stopped. And I sort of just want to end with this, okay? It's really, if you actually spend some time in um, 2 Samuel and the story of Absalom, what you're going to see is there's all kinds of parallels to our Lord Jesus. I mean, like almost uncanny parallels at times. But let me point out just one. This is unbelievably clear. Okay, this is 1 Samuel chapter 15, and you actually heard it read to you from Rebecca, but I want you to hear this again. David went up the ascent of the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. Barefoot, and his head was covered. And all the people who were with him covered their heads, and they went up, weeping as they went. And it was told David... Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And years later, this is what we read in Luke chapter 22. And he came out and went, this is right after our Lord Jesus gave the last, the last supper for the, for the first time, that first Maundy Thursday. And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And he, when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed saying, father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him, him an angel from heaven, strengthening him and being in agony. He prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. While he was still speaking on the Mount of Olives, having just prayed and bled and cried, there came a crowd and the man called Judas, one of the 12 was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the son of man with a kiss? I mean, here's, the, here's, the, here's what I'm getting at. What, what happens when the worst happens? And probably what you're so tempted to do when the wor- what, you, what, what you do with the worst is say, God, how could you let this happen? There's no way that you're a good God. There's no way that you're loving, powerful, all these things that I've been told all of these days. The worst has happened. Forget it. That's the temptation. And the reality is, I actually have no idea why the worst happens. Not really. I mean, I know that God uses it for our good so often. And we hear in Holy Scripture that suffering produces endurance, which is so often true. But we don't really know why so much sin and so much suffering happens in this world. I know that it brings up questions and and C.S. Lewis is right to say that sometimes pain is how God shouts to us and rouses us from our deaf state. What do we do when we're betrayed or when we're abandoned? What do we do when people spit at us and mock us and utter all kinds of evil against us? Well, at the very least, let me tell you this. You can have your desire 
and your delight and your defense in the Lord. Because Jesus experienced all of that. At the very least, remember in those times that God is not far, far off and doesn't have a clue what you're going through and all of that. At the very least, remember that Jesus comes and he suffers, that he gives of his life, that he enters into the worst, his own friend betraying him. I mean, humankind is at times, and certainly the church is called the children of God. And what do the children of God do? They betray Jesus. They hand him over to be killed. He's spat upon and mocked and Because of our sin, he hangs on a cross. All of the worst, the Christian message says, happens to Jesus. And when all the worst happens to Jesus, what happens? Resurrection. New new life a seed buried deep into the ground that dies and beauty comes from it. And what we're told in the Holy Scripture is that Jesus was just the first fruits of that. But all who die in him, all who suffer in him, all who are betrayed in him will be resurrected. And God will bring something really lovely like this psalm out of your suffering. He has done it in Christ and the promise is that he will do it for you. He will. Let me pray for us. Lord, there is not one person in this room who will not experience some of the worst. When those days come as they will, would we find that submission to the will of the Father and hope in you is the safest place? That these other things that we find our desires in and our delights, our defenses are weak, but you are strong, are frail, but you are secure. And God, would we, even in the midst of all of our questioning and our pain, find in you a sure and steady foundation. God, I pray that each person here, that as they encounter the worst, that it would not break them, but remake them. And God, I do pray that you'd give us glimpses of resurrection. We pray that we might occasionally, Lord, see that what others meant for evil, you meant for good. That we might not lose heart. Give us tastes of your resurrection, that when we die, we live. When we take up our cross and follow you, we find life. Hear and answer our prayers, Lord Jesus, in your precious name. Amen.